Hey everybody, Joshua Lewis here with The Remnant Radio. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Today we are doing a new show with John Bunn called Doctrines and Donuts. The show today is going to be about head coverings, reserve seating, braided hair, and gold jewelry in the church. It's going to be an awesome episode. You guys stay tuned. Hey everybody, thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, we got a great episode of Donuts and Doctrines for you this morning. Every Wednesday morning uh, from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock, we are going to be doing a program called Doctrine and Donuts where we come in and we tackle theological issues. We're going to, sometime in the near future, we're going to be dealing with uh, uh, marijuana, uh, gun control, and abortion. You know, We're going to do all that fun stuff. But on my right, your left, I've got John Bunn. John, say hi to everybody. Let them know how your morning's going. My morning is going really well. It's good to be here. Um, this is going to be a great show. Uh, everybody is going to learn a lot. Uh, I was just joking around with Josh at the beginning. By the time we are finished, you will be able to carve in stone everything that we say. Amen. Amen. And if and if you can't build a church off of what we say today, um, I literally would love for a denomination to rise up, uh, the Church of the Holy Braid or uh, the Most Covered Church. Um, the most covered. The church. most covered church. We always have a seat just for you. Yes. Um, wow. It'll, you've hit all of them I in tried. one statement. I tried. Um, <laughs> all the hot buttons. Bing, bing, bing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so these are. Um, someone had said, "I don't want to be the pastor in the pulpit who is answering questions that people aren't asking." I do want to be that pastor. <laughs> I do want to. I do want to be the pastor who's answering questions that literally no one cares about. And I want to be the friend that gets sucked into these discussions. <laughs> <laughs> the reason. The reason I think that this is uh, important. Where am I? I am. Yeah. This tally's not on. That's okay. Um, the reason that I think this is important is because someone someday is going to be on the corner of YouTube trying to find an answer for a theological problem. The only way that they're going to get the answer for that is if we have that answer prepped and it's in advance. Uh, another reason that we're doing it this way uh, is because I think theology matters. I think if we just look at these hard texts and we go, uh, for example, there's a passage in, in the book of Exodus where an angel comes down and tries to kill Moses. And the way that uh, Moses' wife decides to pacify the angels by getting a flint knife and circumcising her children, taking the circumcised foreskin and placing it on his feet and saying, you truly are our bridegroom of blood to me. And people read that text and they go, Next verse, because it's just random and it doesn't make any sense and, right. and it, they don't like it. So uh, we want to tackle those issues because theology matters. And, it if, does. and if we're going to you know, have the Bible in context, we need to understand what it means and what it says. Absolutely. One of the biggest arguments for people who, who want to uh, be dismissive of Scripture and what it says about modern issues is because they don't they, they want to pick and choose and they want to highlight what they like and what they don't like. And, That's right. and as a, as a, a good defender of the, of the faith and a good defender of the gospel, uh, it's important for us to be able to say, you know, based on that thinking, this doesn't work because over here in this other context, this is what this means. So we have to be able to be stewards of the whole word. We have to be able to defend the entire scripture as best as we can. We know in part, prophesy in part, we see through a glass darkly. But as best <laughs> as we can, it's good to be able to hermeneutically uh, address issues and pull things apart so that uh, we can string God's thinking. God's, you know, the scripture is God's self revelation, it's the way he chose to reveal himself to us. And so being able to bridge all of those gaps then helps us culturally to be able to say, well, just because it's popular doesn't make it right. Just because a lot of people think that way doesn't make it right. And just because a few narrow people or a few handful of people believe something some way doesn't make it right. We have to take the whole counsel of Scripture to find out what God is actually saying. That's it. So um, we've got a couple of uh, difficult texts with us today. Uh, you can, if you're taking notes, if you're in your car, please 
pay attention to the road. Um, but if you want to go back and listen to the podcast, if you want to watch us on Facebook or YouTube, the verses that we're going to be going at are First Peter chapter three. We'll be in First Corinthians chapter eleven. We'll be in uh, uh, James chapter two. Uh, and I think we'll be in First Timothy 2 as well. As well. So uh, if you guys look at some of those texts, that will kind of give us a little bit of idea of what we're talking about today. So um, me and John were talking about this before the show. How do we appropriate, how we appropriate, how do we approach the text? When we read Corinthians, when we read Timothy, when we read uh, Titus, the way that we approach the text is actually really important that we talk about that now before we get into the text so that we're able to pull the information out of the text the way it was intended to be. Yeah. So, John, I'll let you give an introduction of, of how you approach any book of the Bible, uh, for whether it be 1 Corinthians or Timothy or James, well, so forth. Well, I, I approach it uh, a couple of different ways, and for me it's usually all both and. It's never really either or. So mm -hmm. I look at the actual context of who Paul is writing to, the culture in which he's writing, the issues that that particular culture is facing. But then I put that up against what did he also say to other cultures in other churches? What did he specifically say? Is this, like we'll read today, this is something that I teach in all of the churches throughout the world. So this is not just a Corinth issue or just an Ephesus issue. This is something that's applicable across the board. But then, overarchingly, it's how has this been communicated since Let There Be Light? How has this been communicated? How will it be communicated long after the final, the bridegroom says come, the spirit says come, all the way to the end of Revelation? So in the whole counsel of God, where does this fit? And to me, that's the most important thing. Then <clears throat> the last thing that I do is I say, how has the church looked at this historically? Which is, which is very valuable. Some it's people would, valuable. would ignore but that's that's actually a big one. Yeah, and and it's it's really important because as you look at how how have people way smarter than me who have looked at this way longer than me, especially within the first several hundred years, and the things that actually began to define everything that's been handed on to us all throughout church history. How has the world defined this? How how has this looked at in other nations? How has this been? looked at by brothers and sisters in China? How is this looked at by, you know, it's not just an American export. Mm -hmm. You know, this is something that, that the culture shapes what we do, but the word of God stands forever. God honors his word above his own name. So there is a, 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 a revelatory global conversation that needs to happen, yeah. as well as a historical conversation that needs to happen, as well as a contextual conversation that needs to happen as well as even within Bible history of Genesis to Revelation, when that was, you know, when that uh, revelation was given by John. So from the very beginning, in the beginning, all the way up through the end of the canon, how is that interpreted with the whole broad brush stroke? And then, then how is it handed down historically? Yeah, so that's... That's a pretty normal um, way of exegeting scripture. And we, we have two terms called exegesis and eisegesis. Exegesis is when we, we take the text and we read, we try to get the principles and ideas from the text out of the text. And then there's eisegesis is when we grab a thought and we read it into the text, right? So, so someone who has uh, an horrid hatred of... I'm going to use this example. I know I'm going to get fired for it, but that's okay. That's the only one that's coming to mind, and I have to teach. So people who hate, 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 hate alcohol on any level can't stand it. They'll read into the text that Jesus turned wine or water into grape juice, right? They refuse to believe it's wine, and they commit what is called eisegesis by enforcing the text and making the text say something it doesn't say. Yeah. Um, and that's a dangerous practice. I'm not condoling the drinking of alcohol. I'm not con I'm, that's a completely different conversation, a completely different episode yes. that you and me might handle one of we these days. We actually take that on. Um, We'll talk about it over a glass of wine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> talk about getting me fired. Joke. Sorry, yeah, so, no, it's a joke. It's, it's okay. a little uh, joke. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, so as as we discuss these theological issues, as we discuss these things, make sure that the way that we're reading is first and foremost to say there is a uh, a verse. Let's read the verse. What does the verse mean? What does it say at face value? Uh, is is this verse clear? 
Okay. There's, there's verses like, and women shall be saved through childbearing. Huh? You know, there are verses that have ambiguity. You know, if you uh, taste of the heavenly gift and then go off in sin, there's no longer room for repentance. Huh? You know, we, we see these verses that are hard to understand. And, and typically there are lengthy chapters that explain in great detail those little bitty verses. So if we would go and read the texts that are plainly make sense, it would help us with those small texts of ambiguity. So we'll read that text of, of seemingly ambiguity, and then we'll read the verses surrounding it. Then we'll read the entire book, and we'll see what it says in the context of that book. And then what John was saying is, really, if you're a scholar, really, if you if you know the context of Scripture, you can see that in light from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, and the application of that. Uh, history, again, very, very important that we approach history, uh, because uh, these arguments have already been had. This is not a new thing. It's an old thing. So uh, today's episode is going to be a lot of fun. Let's dive in. Let's do uh, it. Where do you want to start, man? Uh, let's start with some low-hanging fruit. I, uh, I want I <laughs> oh, to bad choice of words. Okay. I like to do head covering last. Yeah. That way people can watch the whole episode, and then I can give the disclaimer to get your children out of the room while you're listening yes. to the head covering piece. Yeah, that's so, true. Because we have some... Read it, not read it's it not again, explicit but, necessarily. Yeah. fourteen. It's physiological, <laughs> biological yeah. history. Yes. So, so yes. when talking let's, about so let's start that. with uh, let's start with preferred seating. And there we go. James, That's a good one. Yeah. Let's start with James. Pres- preserved. <laughs> you won't say reserved seating. Yes. He's like, nope. Not Pre- doing preferred that. seating. That's a good. That's a good way yeah. of saying it, though. I like that. Okay, so we're gonna go to James, chapter two, chapter verses two. one through five. James chapter 2, 1 through 5. That's James chapter 2, 1 through 5. Okay, so you want me to read that? I see that you're still pulling stuff up. Okay, James chapter 2, 1 through 5. It says, I'll pull over here. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Uh, For it is a man, uh, for if a man is wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly uh, and a poor man, in shabby clothing also comes in. And if you pay attention to the man who uh, wears the fine clothing and you say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over here or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made a uh, distinguishing, a uh, distinguishing <laughs> distinctions among yourselves and become judges uh, with evil thoughts. Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich? Uh, in the faith and heirs in the kingdom, uh, which you have dishonored the poor man, are you not the rich? Uh, are you not the rich, the ones who oppress you, uh, and the ones who drag you to courts? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? So, fun stuff. Yes. Thoughts. Wait on me. Well, I think there's a lot of stuff that that's pretty obvious. You know. Um, we we tend to have a culture where not just in America but but even historically um, where people may not necessarily feel like they're buying their way to the top um, but they definitely you know we in in our fallen nature and our human nature we love power we love proximity mm-hmm. we love access so it's important that um, we understand that you know the the scripture says that there is there is no partiality with the Lord. Mm-hmm. Everybody has access. Everybody's equal. And I think everybody would agree that when it comes to salvation, I think even the people who want to be shown preference mm-hmm. would agree yep. that everybody's welcome at the cross. Yep. And it doesn't matter. I do understand the culture, though, that says, um, well, I'll give you, for instance, like a long time ago when they had these things in churches called cantatas, which were these big musical plays. Uh, I remember uh, specifically seeing um, an, an ending scene where people were coming to the foot of the cross, and it was this big climactic moment in music, and there was a, a nurse who came to the cross, and there was a, a, a child who came to the cross, and there was a fireman who came to the cross. And then at the very end, as the exclamation point to the whole cantata, this guy dressed up like an old bum and homeless guys comes staggering down like he's drunk, and he clings to the foot of the cross, as if to say, that's real salvation. Mm-hmm. 
when a drunk and a and a bum and a drug addict and a homeless guy can get his life right, then then there's the gospel. That's the real as right. if to say the child wasn't you know as horribly lost and hell bound as sure. everyone else in the group, you know, which is doctrinally correct. So when it comes to the no partiality part of it, we look at it and we say, no partiality is no partiality. <clears throat> that means if you got $10 million and you want a golden ticket to the front of the line, you're just as not worthy of that seat as the guy that just came to That's Christ. Right. That's good. You know, when Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise, you talk about a jump to the front of the line. I think it's important when we note, uh, again, taking into the whole context, I believe when Jesus says, um, you you make long tassels, like don't be like the people who want to be seen. Don't, yeah. don't be like, in fact, I think I actually pulled that up in one of my notes that I was making this morning. Uh, it's in Matthew 23. Jesus says, but all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their um, phylacteries, which is which are the tassels at the end of the prayer shawl. They make them broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. He's talking about the the talit and the and the things that define them in their in their um, identity. Um, they love the best places at the feast, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces. And to be called by men, rabbi, rabbi, but you do not be called rabbi, <clears throat> for one is your teacher, the Christ, and all you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth father, for one is your father and who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So when I, I usually want to to put in context two or three scriptures mm -hmm. to balance um, what it is that that is trying to be communicated. But for me, in the words read, Jesus only needs to say it once. Sure, and it's stuck. You know, it's like there aren't three cooperating scriptures that say, "Let there be light." Mm -hmm. There aren't three cooperating scriptures that say it is finished. There's one because God spoke it. And so when Jesus says, listen, don't be like these people. Don't give to get noticed. Don't expect because you give that you're going to be shown preferential treatment. And I would say <laughs> in my lifetime, uh, I have seen a lot of this as an abused situation. Mm -hmm. I would, I, I would... I've been in crusades where the sick people are in the back. Uh, I've been in church services where what I like to say, uh, the lean loaded and lovely mm. are put up front and on camera because <clears throat> it sells. It's better. It's 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 more, you know, a pleasing. And I'm, this is like even even when you're talking about the text, even when you're looking here in these verses, I think that it's plain, it's obvious that he's not only talking about not a salvation-based thing, um, but but unity. I think unity yeah. is such an important piece of this. If, if a homeless guy comes in, if a, if a poor beggar comes in and he sits in our midst and, and you are sitting up front and he is sitting in the back, you have made a distinguishing judge between him and you. And you're saying, I'm going to get something from this guy. That guy can't give me anything. Paul was homeless. Mm -hmm. Paul lost everything. He's been abased. He's been abound. He's able to do all things through Christ. There were times in Paul's life where he was wealthy. There were times in Paul's life when he was dirt broke poor. But no matter when in Paul's life you look, he was always able to give you something. Absolutely. And I think that that is, that is the issue that these people are, are coming to grips with. It's a very, and, and excuse me if, if you can correct me knowing Jew, Judaism a little bit more than I do, it's a very Jewish mindset, and James is writing to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. So, so he's writing to a very Jewish group that believes if you're broke, you're cursed by God. Mm -hmm. If you're blessed, 
uh, it's because that if you're financially wealthy, it's because you're blessed by God. The yeah. hand of God is on you. Right. It's the reason that they weren't going after the, the broke, the hurty, the needing, the, the 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 good Samaritan story. The way that it's such a right hook mm-hmm. is because the Jewish people would have never taken care of this impoverished person, and the good Samaritan was made to be the good guy, and they didn't like that. Right. So so uh, at least as as I read the text, that's that's what I'm gathering. But but how how do we look at this in today's world and in today's standard uh, uh, there's a guy out there named Damon Thompson I'm sure you're familiar with Damon um, but uh, Damon uh, he, there was a section of high donors right and he told his wife he's like hey we're uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna be invited back here and he like he gets up on stage and he goes um, uh, you guys here in this front section stand up and they stand up and and then there's a section of the balcony you guys in the balcony stand up and they stand up and he's like switch spots and they switch spots and then amen he goes, and he said everybody everybody in the bottom everybody in the bottom clap everyone clap clap for him clap for these donors they've given lots of money he said you received your reward before men you'll get nothing in heaven like oh he's, my god he is a fireball yeah but, he is but uh and it's not to say that uh, well we're not provoking on purpose no to offend but the mentality is should be and and this is where i believe where where we where we want to bring right truth Mm -hmm. and and not necessarily definitive because there are other interpretations of this but i full fully believe we're built we're when jesus said there in matthew 23 and he says Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Mm-hmm. Those that, that, you know, back up in verse 11 when he says, uh, but he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Mm-hmm. So I know a lot of very generous and very wealthy individuals who, if you ask them to stick around and clean up and fold some chairs, I know a lot of pastors I know a lot of people who serve like crazy. And those people I almost <laughs> never see sitting up front. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that every this is not that broad of a brush no, to say that. Um, and, and there is a sense that because being on the backside of what goes on in the mentality of someone who says we need a reserve section, a lot of times it is for volunteers it is for people who are like working a conference and they're like sure. man they're they're killing themselves and we want to make sure that they have a good spot we want to make sure that they're in yeah um a lot of people will see the negative connotation like you watch a movie like the greatest showman sure and all of the people who made barnum famous i was thinking of the same reference yeah are left out of the party yeah and oh the the better seats are in the gallery put them in you know put them yeah. up there standing only yeah no that's not they in my opinion they should have been front row center mm-hmm. It would have made the statement that he who is least among you is greatest. He who can't give you anything is more honorable than he who can give you everything. That's right. Because it all comes down to identity. It all comes down to to trust, to source. Yeah. And I know that there are people who want to show appreciation. This all started in a good place. Yeah. So like even my pastor, like it's more of an... um, and honoring it. It's not even, I mean, it's it's more of a logistical thing. Yeah, like, well, that my, too. my pastor sits to the front. Why? So he can make a mad dash to the front. If someone starts prophylying, he can tackle him. My, my pastor would never do that. Yeah. Um, but 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 it's an administrative thing. It makes sense for him to sit up front so he can get yeah. to the pulpit. It makes sense for him to sit up front so he can pray for people. He can whatever. And I, um, I remember going to places, you know, notable revivals. Sure. And, and I knew... <laughs> uh, that as a pastor or as a minister, I love how you're like stepping on eggshells. I can tell you're being so careful. You could go to a side door <laughs> uh-huh. and you could <coughs> skip the line. Sure. The seven hour line, uh-huh. the three day line. And Certain I, revivals. I just refuse to do that. And, and I'm not yeah. saying that that was wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying that that was sinful. I think there, there, there was a mentality in that that says, you know, the people who are responsible for catching this fire and taking it back to their congregation and releasing this over an entire body, over an entire city. Sure. We want to make sure that anyone who's going to get the opportunity to experience this is not just, it, it is going to have the most <laughs> profound and most, uh, oppor- the most opportunity to affect change. So we want all the pastors to experience this. We want all of the, you know, teachers to experience this. I understand that, but, 
I'm wired differently mm-hmm. because of the because of the scripture specifically. I'm wired differently. So even if I had a reserve seat up front, I would probably not sit in it, not to make a statement, but because I'm probably going to make sure that you know if if in Pentecostal and charismatic circles, and this is a little rabbit trail here, if in Pentecostal and charismatic services, we we have prophetic moments like uh, a church I visited Sunday where it was, you know, God's doing something here. There's an anointing on this. Get down here. Get down front. Get down mm-hmm. front. Get down front. I, I didn't need to be healed. I didn't need to be delivered. Right. So I don't want to be the guy that's in the way of someone that does. Sure. So I want them to have quick access. And it's probably wise that, you know, we don't take 45 minutes waiting for the people who need it, who have been relegated to the last row of the back balcony. Mm-hmm. Um to make their way down the stairs, to make their way down front. I was like, man, just put all the sick people down front and be done with it. Amen. Put all the people that need that <laughs> that touch. Not that God can't move throughout the whole sanctuary, not that God can't touch them right where they are, but I think even the mentality of if I want to be <clears throat> considered a leader, you know, think about this in terms of the home. The mom and the dad, they have the kids. Uh, we have kids so that we don't have to do work. Right. We we do our time as youth pastors and children's workers so that we can eventually ascend to the point where, yeah, yeah, I don't have to be worried about setting up and tearing down on all of those things. We have deacons to do that. I want to give myself to the teaching of the word. Well, fine. If that's what you're doing, if you're really praying, if you're really locking yourself up in a room Monday through Friday, nine to five and your staff meetings look like, you know, harp and bowl worship sessions, which I think they should. um, then fine. Fantastic. Don't, don't be bothered by a chair, but don't be offended Mm -hmm. by needing to move one. And that's really for us. I think that's the primary, unless you're a senior pastor and you're violating some of this stuff as members, what we do is we say, okay, we're not going to play into that system. If I'm a wealthy person, if I'm a poor person, I'm not going to play into that system. I'm not going to uh, have preference among us. That's the way that I'm going to handle it. Um, You can bring it up to your pastor in a peaceful, cordial sort of way, Mm -hmm. um, but expect that the culture is probably established. Um, And if you need to find yourself in another church because of a chair seating issue, you might be taking this a little too seriously. I um, agree. Personally, you know, again, logistical issues. I, I reserved a conference recently. Someone said, hey, are you coming to the conference? Let me know if you're going to be there. We'll make, because there's specific seats. Every seat is accounted for. That's a legitimate reason to reserve a seat, right? Uh, I'm preaching on a Sunday and they say, hey, your family's coming. They don't attend this church. Can we reserve seats for them? Sure. That's that's a logistical thing, saying these are people who are guests who are coming in specifically for you. They don't normally come. Is there a way that we can get them close so they can But kind it's of... not because you're the man of God, and, and it's, it's not it's because not, you're no. rich, and nope. it's not because you're influential. We would do the same thing for, for moms who uh, are dedicating their babies yes. when their families come in. Yes. We'd set them up front. Yes. We would do the same same kind Graduation. of thing that we have. Absolutely. We have yeah. CFNI students. Uh, for, they're international CFNI students. As about as broke as you can get. You yeah. know what I mean? We set them up front yeah. because we love them, you yeah. know, uh, because we go to CFNI, pick them up, bring them to church, that kind of thing. So so, so it's not to say that all reserve seating is wrong. It's to say that here in the text, um, giving uh, preference to an individual who's able to financially uh, contribute, I think is dangerous. Um, it's the reason we on Remnant Radio, and again, I don't judge other people. I work for television networks mm-hmm. that do this, um, and it's not its not really my business you know, that they do this, but for us personally, we're not going to be the organization that, hey, if you give $1,000, we'll give you a specific gift, or if you, if you give up to $10,000, we're going to donate this specific thing to you. We say, if you give, that's what you get. Like you get a reward in heaven. That's all. That's all we can offer you. Um, uh, personally, for us, uh, I don't. I don't ever want to 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 provide something of of spiritual value. Um, how do I say this? It's the only example I can give is by illustrating it. You know, hey, we just did a, a three part session on deliverance from demonic powers. If you would like to be completely delivered, buy our other six part set for twenty three ninety five. Mm-hmm. You know, when I read the scriptures, the scriptures say, um, you know, freely, you've freely received. received, freely give. Right. So to me, if I've received understanding, I know there was time of study. There was time that I went into writing this thing. There was time. I get that, but it's God's revelation. It's God's Holy Spirit that showed it to me, and I, I. I get to minister. That's my reward. It's not financial gain. So if you want to donate, if you want to, if you want to help me and my family, absolutely do that. But I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to hold hostage freedom, liberty, 
power gospel transformation for that. So that's one verse, James. We spent almost 30 minutes on James. We're going to have to roll through these a little yes. bit quicker. Yes, we are. So, so we're going to talk about what probably most of you are tuning in for. What a lot of people have actually asked us for is the head covering, the gold jewelry, the braided hair. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about some of those things. Go for it. Uh, okay, so <laughs> we want to uh, take a look at First um, Peter chapter three and First Timothy two. Uh, so let's start with First um, Timothy two nine and ten, and you take First uh, Peter three. Uh, in like manner, also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel. With propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. So just that. Now, if we flip over to First Peter, um, let me pull that up. I should have had that up. Okay. First Peter chapter two, right? Yep. First Peter three. Sorry. Three. Yep. Yeah. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that everyone, uh, uh, so that even if someone uh, do not obey the word, uh, they may be won without a word uh, by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, the clothing that you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, the the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Uh, For this is how uh, the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by subjecting to their own husband, by being subject to their own husbands. There you go. Fun fact of the day. Yes. You're like, you're like switching for me as we're, (laughs) that's quite all right. Uh, So, so what, you know, what is this saying? Is this saying that you can't wear makeup, you can't wear jewelry, you can't braid your hair, you can't, you know, what is this saying? It's actually saying if you do any of those things, you will go straight to hell. I think and it, in no. the, only in the Greek. Only if you, <laughs> yeah. only in the Masoretic yeah. text. Yes, yeah, only in the Masoretic text. <laughs> in the Sinaitic and the Vaticanus. It's like, <laughs> no, the uh, Latin Vulgate. Yeah. So uh, um, I think, again, in context, uh, recognizing the fact that, that Paul, uh, both in First Timothy, is dealing with Ephesus and First Peter, um, and, and who... Peter's communicating with is dealing with because you're coming from two different apostolic viewpoints. Mm -hmm. One's Paul writing to Timothy and the other one is Peter. So both of them are saying culture says your identity is largely wrapped up in what you wear. Very much like we see today. Absolutely. In church. You know, Uh, you can't just have the bag. You have to have the, the bag. bag. Yeah. You have to have the car. You have to have the house. And again, we're we're in a very uh, modern time. Consumer based. Uh, very consumer based. But Solomon writes, "There's nothing new under the sun." Oh yeah. So we can take that Ecclesiastes word, and we <clears> can <throat> apply it to, hey, what we're facing today in 2018, they faced back then. In, you know, Probably on steroids today, yeah. because we can literally put steroids into our body. We can literally pump ourselves full of stuff so that our physical adorning um, is more more appealing. It's more it's more attractive if I can uh, implant this, dye that, cut this, whatever. And again, I'm not I'm not no nope. hammering on all those yeah. things. My wife dyes her hair. You know, I'm just yeah. I'm saying that that this is a a cultural thing that's certainly to this specific culture but it's broadly addressed i think a deeper issue we talked about this identity before the show yeah, yeah. i think men will struggle with and, and this is broad brushes here very broad. very broad okay i'm not i'm not saying women won't deal with these issues and i'm saying that men won't I- deal with identity issues not at all the case uh, but to say broadly speaking men might deal with exerting their leadership in an immoral way they might they might struggle with being godly husbands who love and honor their wives they might more subject them or they may be the apathetic husband who sits on the couch and their wife does everything and they don't lead and they just they just kind of just do nothing and and that's not a, being mothered yeah because yeah. yeah yeah so that's 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 a that's a, a weakness it's unbiblical it's mm-hmm. it's ungodly and it doesn't help raise godly children and so so Paul is coming in through the inspiration of God saying men honor your wives treat them this way and in the same way 
he's, he's helping women understand how that they are to, to win their family, to godly uh, uh, raise a family, the, the best way and the best means by which um, God would be honored. So the issue here, like, like I said, men might struggle with leadership in an, mm-hmm. in an inappropriate way. Women typically possibly broad brushing here will struggle with more of an identity issue um, that that they feel like they're not beautiful unless they have yes all all the garb unless what everyone else around them says right. makes you beautiful yeah so uh, knowing the identity that we have is in Christ mm-hmm. and we are wholly and completely identified by this is my beloved son this is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased that is true we read that in scripture but somehow there's a head heart disconnect in that there's really bad examples uh, from fathers and mothers there's really bad examples from leaders and so we've we we kind of push back on that to say you know well well you know i was never loved i was and, and i'm not minimizing this this is a legit thing this is a real problem it, it is a real problem of identity crisis it, it, who, you know, there a long time back, I preached a message on who's your daddy, you know, and, and <laughs> it's really, really important to know who your father is. It's important to know that no matter what, you know, we're in a culture today where, where the buzzwords, you know, body shaming and all that stuff, I get it. And, and I agree, and I don't think we should, but we shouldn't necessarily even need to be talking necessarily about some of that stuff because we're, we've pulled our identity away from God and we've now started sizing each other up horizontally and we're, we're looking to what the latest trends are. We're looking to what the latest fashion magazines say. We're looking to what culture is defining as beautiful, but we've not kept our eyes on Jesus. And Philippians says, <coughs> Philippians 2, 6 and 8 says, who being in the form of God, Jesus is talking about Jesus in the form of God. There's nothing more beautiful. There's nothing more mm, perfect. It's good. There's nothing <clears throat> that you can add to or take away from its perfection. Perfect hair, perfect eyes, perfect every personality, perfect everything. Perfect. Adam and Eve created in the garden. Perfect before the fall in the image of God. And it says, who being in the form of God, considered it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a Mm. bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Elsewhere, Scripture says, again, as as we balance, what is this theologically? What does this mean? Fine. So we take uh, another verse that says, our righteousness is filthy rags, your best Makeup day, your best hair day, your best uh, workout, your best six pack self six pack selfie, your best. Oh yeah, I do all those day. Tons. I'm a mega church. I'm, body says I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. Working I'm very on pastoral. Church. Yeah. So uh, your your best day, physically, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually. Without Jesus, without his stamp of righteousness on you, without his identity on you, on your own, on my own, my best day is filthy rags. My and, best day. And I think we can actually find really good context for that in the First Timothy passage. Because mm-hmm. in the First Timothy passage, he says to be modest. And he talks about what modesty is. He talks about not the braided hair, not the gold jewelry. Um, and, and, and he says for modesty's sake. So he's not even saying that there's something wicked about gold jewelry. Right. He's not saying there's something wicked about uh, uh, you know woven hair. Mm-hmm. I think one of the, the greatest uh, uh, you know proof text, again, because we're not just committing eyes to Jesus. We're not saying right. jewelry's bad and we're just like, right. this verse means that. Right. We're reading it in context of everything. One of the the most um, beautiful texts is is when um, Isaac is trying to find a wife, right? And they go out and they bring him his wife and she's got her hair all done, her jewelry's got nose rings, face rings, you got rings everywhere, you know what I mean? And, and it's talking about her beauty and how she's adorned and, and those kinds of things, prepping her for her marriage. And, and again, this isn't a when you come into the midst of the assembly, show off. This is, I'm going to look beautiful. I'm going to adorn myself in a way that is appealing and attractive to my husband. Yes. Now, the difference between that and uh, a church setting is that what you're talking about in Philippians 
Philippians says that God emptied himself for the purpose of being relatable so that people can come to him, so people can yes. get understand him and get to know him. And I think that what we do, often or not, we might even be guilty of this today and not just a Corinthian thing, is that we doll ourselves up so good. We have these whited sepulchers full of dead man's bones. People come to us and they see this unapproachable light. Yeah. They see this unapproachable, man, you got everything together. You know, I got three kids. Perfect I've got family, spit up perfect. on my shirt. Yeah. You know, my hair's everywhere. You right. know, I got my makeup's all like jacked up from crying during worship. Yeah. And you look like a freaking statue, yeah. you know? And, and I think it brings this... Whether it's intentional or not, probably yeah. unintentional, a cognitive dissonance between us and them to where I can't relate with them, I can't get to know them, we can't be friends because they're together. Or in in addition to that, they're looking at it and they're saying, oh, if I could be like them. Oh, sure. Even better. Well, go back to Matthew 23. Yeah. Jesus said, call man, no, call no man father. Does yeah. that mean, well, like, I can't call my dad, dad. I can't call my father, father. He's like, no, no, yes, no. Yes, that's what that means. That's not what that means. <laughs> so if, if you... If you understand, it's about identity. I don't want to. I don't want to have my act together like that family. I want to have my act together like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are in this incredible love relationship. Who the Father exalts the Son, and the Son exalts the Spirit, and the Spirit exalts the Father. And and it's it, it's like when you were a little kid, and your mom and dad would hug, and you'd try to weasel up in between them. It's like that's where I want to be found, in between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, in their very perfect, very appropriate, very wonderful, very not carnal thinking love relationship. Um which is pure and holy and beautiful. And I want to be right there in the middle. I want to be that little kid that squirms up in between them. That's the family I want to emulate. That's the finances I want to emulate. That's the, 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 the priority system that I want to emulate. And so I'm not looking horizontally because when I look horizontally to, to see you've got it together, the enemy is right there to make sure that I'm also looking horizontally to, to assess my sin that's good i'm not i'm i'm not as i'm not as bad as that guy <laughs> yeah uh, well but, at least i'm yeah. not hitler yeah right exactly so y- you you have this temptation and it's a very real temptation to begin to put successes and failures on a horizontal plane and unless you put your successes and failures on a vertical plane which only has one conclusion you're lost i'm lost it's horrible without Jesus. Yeah. I have no hope. I have no shot. There's no job. There's no house. There's no car. There's no jewelry. There's no designer this or designer that. There's no perfect body. Nothing will bring me into fellowship with perfection but Jesus. Yeah. So that's why when I have that locked in my heart and I know who I am, and God looks at me and says, beloved son in whom I am well pleased, then I will lay my life down on my best day. I will lay my life down on my worst day. None of the, the things that are going on next to me will ever matter. It, the devil won't be able to come and say, well, if God chose you, if God has a plan for your life, if God has called you to something, prove it. So I don't need to prove it. Bringing this down, because we've got 15 minutes yeah. before that last one. So we have bringing this down to application level. I think the best way that we can say, that's how, how, are we gonna, how are we going to apply this? The best way to apply this is to say, uh, when, you're, when you're coming to church, it doesn't mean put a burlap sack on, right. you know, jack up your face and show up so people can approach you, because that's not going to happen, right? So, right? so the goal is not to distinguish yourself far above everyone else. So I think that the, the most natural conclusion is not that he's saying, don't braid your hair, don't, don't do your, your, your makeup, don't put gold jewelry on. I think what he's trying to say is there are women who can't afford and can't uh, adorn themselves in the same way. So come as they are adorned. So, so I think the best way to do that is to show up at church and if everyone's wearing shorts and t-shirts, don't show up in a three-piece suit. That can apply to men. It can yeah. apply to women. Yeah. The application is not to boast with your physical appearance above everyone else. So, yeah. so, so, so when in Rome, I think, is really the best kind of approach to this. That's good. And secondly... Please, please, please don't look ugly for your husbands. Um, go read the Song of Solomon. Um, I'm not going to do a podcast on that no. ever, uh, but because uh, it's it is a raunchy book. Anyway, um, it, it, there's nothing wrong with romance. There's yeah. nothing wrong with beauty. There's yeah. nothing wrong with adorning yourself right. in that way, right. um, especially for 
a romantic relationship right. like a husband and a wife. And let me just before we move on to our last topic, uh, let me put a cherry on that on that Sunday. Uh, <laughs> go read the book of Esther. Sunday. I see what you did there. Go read the book of Esther. Oof. And, and recognize in the book of Esther where all of the women, when they were getting ready to be presented to the king. Now put this in context of Jesus. Put this in context of your husband. Put this in context of whatever, whatever relationship would fit this, this example. When the women were being ready to be presented to the king, mm-hmm. all the women were saying, well, red looks good on me. Blue looks good on me. Green makes my, you know, whatever. Esther went to the people who were closest to the king and said, what is the king like? I want to dress myself. I want to adorn myself in what makes me attractive to him. And so Paul is, I believe, directly pulling context in this by saying it's the inner thing that God looks at. That's good, man. Don't adorn yourself with the external stuff. Because suddenly you become unattractive. Don't, don't be, be the pure, be the sweet, be the holy, be the powerful, be the beautiful, be the, the abandoned before. I I would imagine that the woman who dropped the alabaster box all over Jesus may or may not have been dressed appropriately. We can't let our external adornment keep us from, Ooh, that woman just walked in in a hauler top and hot pants. Yeah. She's a hooker and she just got saved. She doesn't know any better. (laughs) And, and you're not going to stand there and judge her and make her feel horrible. Yeah. Her sin's done that enough. Jesus has said, oh, if he knew what kind of woman, what, you know, Jesus is like, no, 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 no. If, if he knew that woman was a harlot, he wouldn't let her. Yeah, he knew exactly what she was. Yeah, but he saw the inward beauty. But he saw the inward beauty. And that's, that's good, what man. Paul is going after. So be like Esther. What does the king like? Okay, so the, the what do you call it? Last the, one. The, the, it's it's Parents that French get word. Your children out of the world. Yeah. So yeah. so John has got a couple points. I've got a final one that uh, I picked up from a linguist who's very uh, notable, very respected. His name is uh, Michael Heiser. Michael, I think it's episode eighty six of the Naked Bible bo- broadcast. Michael is he speaks, read Greek, um, all that all that good stuff, all the dead languages. He's very well versed in. Uh, so he's he's very uh, understanding. But the the Ultimately, here's your here's your disclaimer. This part's going to get very mature. It's yeah. not inappropriate. It's yeah. not going to be crass. Like a health class. It's going to be like a health class. Yeah. So if you have small children, uh, if you're listening uh, on the radio or you're listening on a podcast, go ahead and uh, pause this, listen to it a little bit later, that kind of thing. Uh, but we're gonna we're, John's gonna do his opening. It's not gonna. I'll, again, I'll give you another disclaimer when when we're about ready to make people uncomfortable. Uh, yeah. When people are gonna giggle like youth group. So um, uh, there's there's a couple of approaches. And Lot pitched his tent. Oh my so, gosh! I was a youth group reference. Never mind. Yeah, don't. Yeah, don't YouTube, YouTube it. it. Um, <laughs> please YouTube it. It's hysterical. It is really funny. Uh, I'm not going to pretend I'm that <laughs> self righteous. It is really funny. All right, go ahead. Uh, okay, so First Corinthians 11. Uh, we'll pick up there in verse one, um, and it says, "Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ." Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions, just as I delivered them to you. Now, stop right there. That word in the Greek, keep the traditions, it is the same Greek word that he uses when he says, as I received this revelation on the Lord's Supper, I deliver it to you. It's the exact same word, okay? So, uh, keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is a man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man Praying and prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is the one and the same as if her head were to be shaved. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shaved or shorn. Uh, but if it, but it is, sh- if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, then let her head be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. So, again, we're we're not talking about this dominating thing. In every wedding ceremony that that I perform, I, I make sure for people to understand that when Eve was taken from Adam, she was taken from his side, not his head, that she could rule over him, 
not his foot so that he could rule over her, but from his side and close to his heart so that they could live and serve together. Mm -hmm. So this is not misogynistic or women bashing or men are better than women. This is the biblical order. Unless you're things. talking about sports. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> let's let's go. That's Guys, a I don't watch show. sports. I'm just being That's the devil's advocate. Show. Je Jeff isn't here, so we're not. Or we're women's not. wrestling. If you guys are offended by High that, just wrestling. wait. It gets worse. So anyways, um, so I just, right up front, we're... we're Forgive me, John. We're you're associated with me now. <laughs> no, it's good. Uh, right up front, we're talking about about relational okay we're, we're talking about a joint relational responsibility but god has set certain things in order and so what paul is addressing here is the head covering in a church <coughs> for public prayer or prophecy it would be inappropriate to symbolize the cap of revelation the the ceiling of revelation stops with me because I'm wearing a head covering. It doesn't. It, it proceeds from God. But women could, should, depending on how you interpret the Greek, uh, it would be appropriate for them to demonstrate that they are under submission. Now, before you freak out and flip off and click somewhere else, what was the greatest faith that Jesus saw in Scripture? And he said to all of his brothers and sisters, all of the people of Israel, I have never seen this great of faith, not even in all he said it of twice. Israel. So I don't know what you're doing. Yeah. He said it twice. Well, he said it twice. Well, he said it to the centurion and yeah. he said it to the woman who's well, begging for crumbs. Well, he said, woman, great is your faith. Mm -hmm. But to the centurion, he said, I've never seen this kind of faith, not even oh, in yeah. all of Israel. Talking about the sons of Israel he be was cast talking out and... about the centurion who came to Jesus and said, I recognize that you are powerful because you are a man under authority. So th this is not a bad thing to recognize the fact that there is, in the order of creation, Adam then Eve, revelation coming down from Adam, he either dropped the ball with Eve or Eve just decided to be deceived. But Paul clearly starts talking about how woman was deceived, men went in eyes wide open, men were manipulated, men were, were allowing what God had said to be trumped by what someone else had said. Woman, serpent, doesn't matter, it wasn't God who said, don't eat of this tree. It was Adam's responsibility to pass that information on to Eve. So as God is the covering of man and man represents in the marriage relationship, our bridegroom, we represent the bridegroom. That's not a chauvinistic thing. That's a, that's just an order of creation thing. We represent the bridegroom. The bride represents the church. So we represent Jesus. We're not Jesus, but we represent Jesus and the bride represents the church. She's not the church. She's a wife. But that doesn't, we are, we cannot do anything without our headship. We so can't do anything without Jesus. Do women wear head coverings? I think there are four different ways that you can interpret this. One is that it has absolutely no relevance to us today. It was totally cultural, which I think is a dangerous way to interpret because then you can say, well, homosexuality is cultural. It's mentioned or, in first Corinthians as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think that's you throw that out because then you can start picking scripture apart across the board. Uh, another one is to say, uh, it represents her hair. So that her hair is her hair. Her covering. hair is her covering. And then that gets kind of dangerous because yep. you're like anyone who trims a little is anyone who, less holy who cuts their hair. It's shameful for women to cut their hair. My so wife's my wife's out. Your wife's out. Trouble. Um, you know, uh, on, only Crystal Gale can get into heaven. Praise God. Uh, so uh, or share in the 70s. Um, really long hair. That's there, the whole point. There may be it's other. Really, anyway, really, keep yeah, going. There's keep other going. people who have long hair too. Like uh, seven minutes the, left. <laughs> yeah. The third, the third point is it is absolutely literal. No one should ever prophesy. No woman should ever speak or pray or prophesy. Pray or prophesy is what the scripture actually says. So mm -hmm. no woman should ever do that without something on her head. And we have a woman who comes to our church. She does this. Who, she brings a scarf. It's yeah. very modest. You don't like, oh, look, look at that person. Look, they're so, they're so odd. And she'll either put on a hoodie or she'll put the scarf over her head, mm -hmm. you know, during the time of worship. And then she'll take it down for the word 
and then Shalif, and nobody notices. Like it's right. so discreet, like you right. wouldn't even know unless you know her. And I don't know that that's not biblical. It's not like this giant prayer shot. You know, right? it's like I I know a woman who was young in the faith, mm-hmm. and her baby was sick, had a horrible case of diaper rash. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the ladies in the church called her and said, "Honey, you just need to apply the word. You just about God His healings for today. Just apply the word." She literally took a piece of paper out of her Bible and shoved it in the baby's diaper. She's that young in, in, in Jesus. Apply and, the word. And the baby got healed. I'm not kidding you. The testimony was amazing. <laughs> so God will take he that. He meets us faith. where we're at, right? Yeah, he meets us right where we're oh at. Oh my so gosh. I and the, the last ver the last the popular interpretation of it is is that it is it is important because God it, Paul's not mincing words in the Greek. He's serious. Right. This, this has validity, but it's not necessarily literal that we've got to put doilies or prayer shawls or scarves or whatever. Um, it is it is symbolically representing, in my opinion, what my, before Josh jumps in on his, and he'll <laughs> take the rest of the time to do that, all 30 seconds. Uh, and, and it is, you are demonstrating the fact that you are submitted to someone. So male, I think male and, and female, there's gatekeepers in our churches. Yeah. You're not just going to go grab the mic and go do something without somebody knowing what you're up to because we're in relationship and because we have agendas Community. that that the Holy Spirit wants to accomplish in the day. And you may very well have a word, but it may not be for right now. Yeah, it may not be for so, today. So we've got about three, four minutes left in the program. So I want to I want to address this linguistical approach to the text, and I think it has powerful explanatory power to the text. Um, Again, I'm not getting this. I'm not making this up. I don't understand Greek or Hebrew. Um, I'm going off of uh, skilled uh, theological theologians. These are not uh, Pentecostal charismaniacs. These are not people who who just go with whatever wind of doctrine that comes their way. These are. This is a a a founded biblical journal that is respected throughout the world. These are theologians who are looking through this and reading into it. And if you really want someone who can walk you through it, who knows the context, again, I believe it's episode 86 of the Naked Bible. Uh, broadcast on iTunes. You can go to the, their podcast section and find out Michael Heiser does a breakdown of this text. And it is, it's got, it's got the most explanatory power of anything that I've seen. And I wouldn't even say, yes, I believe this 100%, but I would say it really makes a whole lot of sense. Um, ultimately, the idea is the Hippocratic Oath. We know, we know the Hippocratic Oath. That, that's what doctors take before that they become doctors. Uh, Hippocra- Hi- Hippocrates is the father of modern medicine, right? Well, he wrote in his early journals and has been popularized throughout history, it's a known fact that during the first century, this did indeed happen. And this was a legitimate practice that they believed that um, anyone, uh, that men, uh, again, children escorted out of the room, pause the video. This is where things get strange. Okay. That children have hair, male children in particular, have semen. And because of that, their semen is held in their brain. And because of that, they have hair on their head. And at the age of puberty, something in their body opens up that allows the semen from their head to go down to the genitals, which causes hair growth in the southern regions. So um, this is his uh, explanation for long hair and short hair. And that women have, when they have long hair, and this is Hippocrates again, that when women have long hair, it, 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 it works as a suction right, to receive the sperm that goes up into the hair, which are these hollow chambers, is what he believes. Again, this sounds odd, but uh, modern medicine, modern science, um, you know, uh, they, they believed the earth was flat, you know, uh, only a thousand years ago. You know, they, they believed in spontaneous generation, that if you put a piece of meat out, flies would just spontaneously generate on top of it. We all know that that's factually inaccurate. Uh, but if Paul is saying he's making an argument from nature, Aren't men and women supposed to reproduce? And men with short hair, they're able to reproduce. But if men have long hair, they're not able to reproduce because it acts as that suction, keeping their semen from flowing. Now, again, if you, those of you who are watching going, this is outrageous, go look, look, to, look to this journal, uh, look to this theological principle, what it's called. I know we're supposed to wrap up. Paul's argument for nature in the veil in 1 Corinthians 11 through 13. Sub, subtitle, a testicle instead of a head covering. Um, it's so raw, but it's it's what it is. We have uh, text uh, from Hercules um, in uh, Euripides quotes this when, or Euripides writes this when referring to Her- Hercules and he uses the word parabolion, which is the word for head covering here. He uses it for the testicles there and he also uses par- parabolion when referencing to Achilles. So 
If you read through this journal, if you listen to that podcast, it makes an intense amount of sense. That's why he says, beware of the angels, because he thinks that if your hair is part of your reproductive system, that it could tempt angels, because that's what happened in Genesis 6. So it has an immense amount of explanatory power if you understand what they believed about nature in that time. Oh man, I've got six yeah. seconds. So, go, go, so, so, so go read this we'll stuff. Go with just a little go, bit longer. Go, go read this stuff. Go check it out. Let me know what your thoughts are. Again, I'm not the guy who's saying this. I believe for sure, but it has an immense amount of explanatory power in this text. Is there one more text. little nugget in there that you want to? Um, is there something up? specific that no, you for you for me? Yeah, for what you what you want to bring. I don't. Is there something that that I'm forgetting that you? No, I no? just okay. I just want to make sure that you. Yeah, no, that's that's basically the position. That's basically the opinion and belief. Okay, so so go so read we don't up on leave it, you, it. We don't want to leave you with the impression that 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 m- mythical or or no, that's not un- absolutely yeah, not right. The case. So, Paul was just using the nature that he, he thought was. he understood, the science yes. that he understood, and that's why he says this. Judge before yourselves. I'm pulling this argument from nature. He doesn't even say this is inspired through scripture or that God said it. I think one of the strongest arguments to say that Paul is not making a theological point is because the high priest would wear a turban on the day of Yom Kippur or every day, and they'd go into the holy place to minister before the Lord. Well, obviously they're set under authority, and if it's if it's ungodly for a man to have his head covered, why would Paul be making a theological principle? Someone who's well-versed in tabernacle studies, I think he's probably referencing something else, something yeah. in nature, and that would make the most explanatory sense to me. And, and really just that, you know, that, that there is that there is that recognition that even Jesus said to Peter, you rightly say, I am the Christ, but we both know you didn't get that. Yeah. So I think it's just that recognition of that, that, you know, we know in part, we prophesy in part, we're submitted one to another, we are, we are willing to work in a system that there are leaders and there are followers and that doesn't mean that you're bad or that you're not good or or that something's broken or that you can't do anything uh but but that there there is a system that god has put in place and an order that god has put in place and when we in our heart want to do something to push against that to defy that to say well that's dumb that's stupid that's archaic that's blah 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 i'm gonna do what i want to do that's the problem right there i'm gonna do what i want to do that's it. So a couple, couple uh, uh, side notes before we end the show today. Uh, check out our show on Mondays. We have two shows on Mondays. We have uh, Lunchtime Theologians with Michael Mitchell. Uh, it's a great program where we're doing systematic theology, going through a systematic approach to a uh, theological study. Uh, then we have our Monday night interviews where we have different pastors and teachers come on and help us challenge orthodoxy. Um, uh, and then uh, we've got our Mon- or Wednesday morning, Doctrine and Donuts here with me and John Bunn, and we'll be going through uh, really culturally relevant. We'll talk about weed and gun control and, and abortion. We'll talk about uh, uh, strange theological texts in the Bible and how we can come to reason and grapple with them. I, it's going to be some fun shows, so tune in on any of those time periods, and if you want to give to the ministry, go to our website at theremnantradio.com. We're trying to raise $25,000 for a new studio. We're producing this on uh, this iPad and a couple of iPhones. So uh, please donate so that we can get our equipment upgraded to reach the nations uh, through satellite television and the interwebs. You guys be blessed. We will see you next week. Love you.